Elizabeth Gulistan, Omar, hey, congratulations on your short documentary film, Three Songs for Benazine. Thank you. Thank you. M much more of a congratulations that it is, what, on the short list for the Academy Awards? I mean, how do you folks feel about that? It's pretty incredible for us um, that this intimate love story will be able to have a global reach like this and, you know, even to be on Netflix on January 24th and then to be shortlisted for this film that we've worked on so closely for so many years um, is pretty amazing. I know a lot of people don't understand is uh, how long filmmaking process is, and especially documentaries. Uh, tell, tell us how, how long this one actually did take. We started in 2013 15, yeah. um, and then we finished shooting at the very end of 2019 and released the film, you know, got into the edit, which took a while. And then the film premiered in June, 2021. So. <laughs> it is, it is such an amazing thought to, uh, to think about a short film that actually spanned uh, year, years and years. So let, let's ask that obligatory question. What sparked this documentary? What actually uh, initiated this? Well, it came from our relationship with Shaista. It's born out of a friendship. So the, the seed of the documentary is this friendship that we had with Shaista, which has itself now spanned over a decade. And when we felt he's, he's so full of wonder and curiosity, and we were so drawn to him. I know that for Abulasan as well, you had a a deeper connection with him um, that you can talk about too. But I think also we saw this relationship with him and Benazir and what happened when they were in the room together and this intimacy and this love story and in a region that you don't typically associate with um, love stories like this and this tenderness between them. And that's really what compelled us to make this film. And I know you can talk a little bit too about your connection if you want to. Yeah, we, 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 we met, uh, um... Elizabeth and I met uh, Shaisa uh, more than like 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, um, to be honest with you, it's uh, 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 the access, uh, it's, it's, uh, can, most people can't get the access, but uh, we got the access because I'm Afghan and I can go anywhere in Afghanistan. And, uh, but the, 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 the other people can't. And well, I'm trying to go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, for speaking. Yeah. Is it okay if you speak Sari and I translate for this That's part? Fine. Yeah. Okay. But the Afghanistan, who has the news in the world, the headline is that there is always a In Afghanistan, the headlines are always just war. Uh, uh, explosion has shown. And the news longi has. ولی من میخواستم که در عمق داستان برم نشان بدم که نه در داخل خانه عشق هست محبت هست و و آرزو آرزو هست Yeah, and, and it's always just war and guns and turbans. And I wanted to go beyond those headlines and bring you into the depth of the story that there is love and there is hope and dreams. و من میخواستم از دیدگاه خودم میخواستم به دنیا نشان بدم که نه مردم افغانستان داخل خانه میتونن که رمانس کنن یک دنیای دیگه دارن and i wanted to show as an afghan filmmaker you know through my own lens that in inside the homes of afghanistan people, there's love and people can fall in love there's romance and yeah i forgot yeah and afghanistan cannot just be defined or summarized by war most excellent. And how easy was it to convince him to uh, participate in this documentary? Well, we had known Shaisa for three years about before we started filming this. So we were really involved with him and his family in a much different capacity. Like we would, you know, um, we were there visiting all the time, trying to help out when we could. We accompanied some elders in the camp to different min meetings at ministries to help them with kind of getting more um, supplies and support from the government and so the access is really about that friendship that we had and of course because you're Afghan and shared this connection with Shaista you know Gulistan was also displaced by the war um, in Afghanistan and uh, lived as a refugee too so they had this shared experience and then I speak the language and we were just able to over time just you know through friendship. Could you tell us about the uh, logistics of a uh 
filmmaking in Afghanistan at that time. Um, I, I can't imagine it, it was an easy process. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it, it's hard to say because we were living there. And so I lived there for a long time. And obviously, Golestan is, of course, from there. And um, I think you just, like you, we love the country. Obviously, it, it's my second home. It's Golestan's native land. And we just felt like we wanted to tell stories. And, and it, it's difficult, as, it, as of course it is. Um, you know, in, in terms of this film, logistically, like, and even just in terms of equipment, we had very limited resources to work with. We could only afford a really inexpensive camera with a single lens. Um, it wasn't even a good lens at that time. It was like all our budget dictated, but we wanted something really compact that could just fit in my purse and would be unobtrusive and not attract any attention. Um, you know, because there are, of course, security concerns that you are constantly aware of when you're working in Afghanistan. So, so uh, t tell us, uh... What is that balloon that was flying over the village? Is, what, is that actually uh, us Americans uh, monitoring them? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, we're not in, inside there. <laughs> but um, it's just, it's full of cameras, full of eyes. It's this eye in the sky that's just constantly watching what's happening from, I, don't, I mean, I've never seen the inside of the balloon. It's like a, as much mystery to us as it is to Shaista and Benazir in the camp. And it just becomes part of your daily reality, like the surveillance um, hovering over you at all times. We, we so, tell ourselves that it's actually Netflix and the Academy were inside the balloon <laughs> and uh, getting ready to swoop down and scoop up this beautiful film, which rightfully they did, but they're back in the balloon now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's such a, an, um, I think this short film is such an eye opener because a lot of us don't know what the, you know, the normal life of a, about Afghani uh, um, through through this entire uh, process. So uh, for Shaista, he one of the most amazing stories is that he tries to join the military. And um, could you tell the process? Uh, tell us um, all this. He was just doing it for the family. Am I correct? But yet his his uh, his parents and the village were quite opposed to it. Yeah, so he wanted to join the military and he wanted to find a way to support himself and, you know, his new responsibility as a, as a new husband and soon to be father at that time. But I think it's also important to note that this is this was not the easy path for him. Like there, the, it would have been much easier for him to support himself by continuing to work in the op opium, the poppy fields like he, the rest of his family did. Um, and he went against everything like he, he 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 went against everyone, essentially, to try to carve out this path for himself because he also dreamed of being able Able to defend his country and I think also of being part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. Now the, the opium part a lot you know for a lot of Americans they don't understand that this is actually the livelihood over there this is this is normal I, I I've, I've talked and I've spoke to several people and they said you know it's just everywhere could you actually elaborate on how normal this is for you know his family and, and his village? Yeah, well, he's from southern Afghanistan and in a particular province, Helmand, which uh, produces most of the country's opium. And it is, it's just, it's a way of life um, without many other options for people like the price of, you know, working as a farmer and growing wheat and really not being able to survive off of that. And then the, the temptation to then grow opium to be able to support your family is a very real one. And it was just something that um, was very much just part of their daily life and upbringing. I mean, we would drive past, we've been to Hellman a couple times ourselves, and just there's opium fields essentially everywhere. What, what besides the soldier life or the opium field, fields, do they have other choices of careers? I, I know there was a little bit of a um, show, showing a bricklaying that, uh, that he, he tried to do. Yes, he did try to do the bricklaying but it was I mean the, the as you could see in the film like he couldn't even make any money essentially off of that at all and they're also very marginalized the people who live inside that camp are really marginalized even inside Kabul they're ostracized um, they're not really welcomed they're considered outsiders from the south or people regard them suspiciously um, and so it's very difficult for them to just break into the economy there, and which is obviously suffering anyway. So in the process of filmmaking, 
um, trying to document uh, his life, how how much time did you actually really did spend with him? Did you basically spend it, uh, you know, a short period of time or you followed him like all year? How, how did this process actually work uh, for, for you, you folks? We followed them all year. I mean, we were just there in and like we were living there full time. And then in between other jobs that we would take freelancing, we would just go visit them in the camp. You know, obviously not always with a camera. Oftentimes we would just go visit Shaisa because he's our friend. So it was a period of being in and out of the camp throughout every month for um, over three years. And then, you know, so it's hard to calculate. It wasn't, but I don't think there was a month that went by that we didn't go at least twice to film with Shaista in Venezia. Wow. Tell, t- tell us more about that song that he actually sang at the beginning of the short film. Well, it's interesting because we, you know, you're a native Dari speaker, which is one of the main languages of Afghanistan. And I speak Dari as well, but that song is in Pashto. And um, neither of us speak Pashto. We speak a little bit of it. So we didn't understand what the song was and how beautiful the songs that he sang were and, and, and how rich and, and meaningful they were and um, kind of the nuances that they carried. So we didn't even realize what was being said until we got into the edit. Oh, wow. <laughs> so so this song was a complete complete surprise, which is... That yeah, is- the meaning was a complete surprise, but we but we knew while we were filming it that we that it was something beautiful and rare, and that we that we really wanted to include it in the film. Like it was just something that we felt very strongly about even while while shooting it. Great, and um, and what about the aftermath of the four years later? Um, why did you felt necessary to include that into a short film like this? To- I mean, you you, you could have easily ended it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to let Omar jump in here too, so I'm not just talking the whole conversation, but because this was for, it was the reality of what happened. You know, Shaisa's story does not end in the poppy field. Um, and we, and it, our friendship did not end there either. And we had left Afghanistan at that time for a few years. Um, I was pregnant with our first child. And when we found out what had happened to Shaista and really the shattering consequences of those choices that he was forced to make to, to build a life together with Benazir, we felt we just wanted to film and follow up with him and, and it was part of his story. And Omar, do you want to add anything? No, I, I think, um, I mean, the only thing I might add to that is that, look, Gulistan and Elizabeth have, have done something actually really quite remarkable in the degree to which they remained open to what was unfolding in front of them, right? And that's much easier said than done. And I think, I've been in documentary film for years and, you know, 80, 90% of the time, people are simply taking their filters over and slapping them onto some part of the world. And um, that's actually the standard, right? And they remained open. And I think, you know, that ending without giving it away is a shattering and tender uh, and both resilient and heartbreaking. It's a nuance of reality, like like real life. And these guys have remained open to Shaista's um, and Benazir's story in a way that that means that they deserve the highest accolades that nonfiction can give them. Frankly, with that, and and that's you know, there's there's a one of my favorite. I'll say it influences is the, is, the, is the late architect Louis Kahn, who was, who was fond of saying in his lectures at the University of Pennsylvania that he would tell a story that, you know, you, you look at a brick and you say, what do you want? And you say, maybe we'll make a bridge or something, or maybe we'll make a coliseum and brick keeps repeating, I want an arch, I want an arch, and I want an arch. And Kahn held that as the highest standard of, of architecture. And, you know, the, these, these wonderful filmmakers have uh, brought that standard to bear on this short film by just responding to what the film wants to be and, and, and we're lucky enough to be able to watch that now. I think that's an, that's an excellent perspective. Absolutely. And um, have any of you still keep on contact with Shaisa and uh, Benazir after 
the country has changed so much as we all know it. Yes. Yeah, we, we, we have a contact with him because one of our, our producers is living there and we sent for like a, um, money for him to buy the food and for the winter stuff. Yeah, so we've been, we've been in contact with them. Um, like Jula Sam was saying, our, one of our producers, Jamil, will go there in person to visit them and bring support. And we've just been calling them um, every week or so, I'd say. Great. Well, I'm, we're, we're glad that uh, they are they're living safely uh, abroad, and, and that is certainly good news. So what, what, what is next up uh, for projects for all of you now, after this is all completed? I mean, it's a long journey. Of all. <laughs> it's a long journey. It's a long journey. And we have a couple other projects in development that are still quite early to even speak about. So, but hopefully they're, they're quite different than what we've done before. So. I, I'm, I, I'm, I want to make these two blush and say that I, I, I hope I see these two, you know, making a, a feature film next, you know, because they, they've, there's nothing left for them to do on the short. I mean, they've, 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 they've made a short better than most features, right? So I want to see them do a series or a feature, whatever that is next. We'll all be very lucky for it. <laughs> well, there you go. You just heard it from Omar. He would like to produce a, a <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you have to produce that. <laughs> yeah. Most excellent. Well, let, let, let me wrap it up with one last question. When audiences they're going to have a great chance to watch this on Netflix. A lot of people are already going to start talking about it because it's uh, on the Oscar shortlist. What is the one most important lesson that you hope that they would take out of this documentary? Who wants to, who wants to chime in? That's a great question. I don't know if there's a particular lesson so much as we, we hope that people relate to this <laughs> love story and to this young couple who have, nothing in the world except for each other and hopes and the dreams that they hold on to and we hope that it shifts your perception of what you think about Afghanistan and the region. I'm, I'm going to add something to that because I do I do think I want people to take something away from this and there's multiple things that they can take and this is just Omar speaking yeah which is that people you might not have paid attention to they have gifts to give to and I'm quoting Arundhati Roy there in um the God of small things who's writing about a Dalit and untouchable then, you know, Afghanistan has been treated like that. And these people with regard to family, community, uh, yes, even romantic love and a sense of honor, they, they have gifts to give us too and things we might learn as well. And, and, I, and, and that, that personally would make me quite happy. <laughs> well, that, that, those are great answers. Well, anyways, Gulistan, Elizabeth, Omar, it's a pleasure uh, speaking to you, um, folks, about the three songs of Benazir. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to cheer you on uh, for those nominations. So <laughs> good Thank luck. With Thank, Thank you, you so much for your us. time. Thank you, Gig. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hopefully next time. Bye now. Thank you.